Hey, this is Justin from BreakingToCRE.com, and in today's video, we're gonna talk about modeling income taxes in a real estate financial model. So if you're wondering whether or not to include an after-tax analysis in your real estate financial model, and if you're going to include it, how to actually run that analysis, make sure to stick around for this video. Now, if you're new here on this channel, we talk about real estate investing careers and real estate financial analysis. So if you're looking to break into the industry or advance your current real estate investment career, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Now in real estate financial models as a blanket statement, income taxes are generally not included in the real estate investment analysis. And there are several reasons for this. The main one being that most real estate investments are held in the US through what are called pass-through entities for tax purposes. And these are generally LLCs or partnerships that are not subject to income tax at the company level. And that tax burden is passed down to the owners of the company at the individual income tax level. So on commercial real estate deals, especially when you get into eight and nine figure transactions, most of the time you're going to have multiple investors on the deal on that equity side. So in that case, if you were to model income taxes, you would have to make a blanket assumption about all of your investors on the deal. And obviously each investor is going to have their own unique tax situation based on their own income levels. Now, with that said, if you're just modeling a deal specifically for your own investment purposes, and you wanna see what that after tax cash flow might look like, there are a few things that you could add to that real estate financial model that's going to give you a better idea of that taxable income at the end of the year. Now with the caveat that I am not an accountant and you should definitely consult with your CPA to figure out how your own individual tax situation works, there are a few things that are generally incorporated into an after-tax analysis. So the first part and really the base of your calculations is going to be your net operating income or really your revenue minus your expenses. And once you have that net operating income, from there you can start calculating what your total taxable income might be. So the first deduction that you'll likely be able to take is an interest expense deduction. So if you have a loan on the property and you're paying interest payments to a lender, those interest payments are going to be tax deductible and deductible from that net operating income amount. Now it's important to note that you can only deduct the interest portion of your loan payments, not the principal payments or the payments that actually pay down your loan balance. Now from here, once you have your operating income less your interest expense, the next line item that you can deduct is your depreciation expense. And this is often referred to as a phantom expense because you're not going to see any sort of cash outflow that's going to reflect this, but the IRS allows you to take a deduction that is going to reduce your taxable income on the deal. Now calculating your depreciation expense can get pretty tricky, especially when you start taking into account things like a cost segregation analysis or potentially bonus depreciation as well. So make sure that you're consulting with your CPA to figure out exactly how to calculate this. But with that said, if you just wanna get a general idea of what your depreciation expense might be every year, one way to do this is to straight line your depreciation expense over the allowable useful life determined by the IRS. So in the US for residential properties, including residential properties with five or more units, the IRS allows you to depreciate the property over a 27 and a half year period. Now for a commercial deal, this time frame is a little bit longer. So if you're analyzing an office, retail, or industrial property, that property can be depreciated over a 39 year schedule. Now what this means is that investors can deduct about 3.6% of the total value of the building for a residential property every year and about 2.6% of the total value of the building for a commercial property each year. Now it's important to note that you can only depreciate the value of the structure on that property, not the value of the land that the structure was built on. So at the end of the day, most real estate financial models, especially in the institutional and private equity world, do not include an after-tax analysis because of multiple investors on the deal and different tax situations for every investor that invests. That said, if you do wanna create your own after-tax analysis for your own real estate investment deal, taking that net operating income, subtracting your interest expense, and then subtracting whatever your depreciation expense is going to be on the deal is going to give you a good idea of what that total taxable income is going to be that's derived from your property. Now, if you wanna learn how to incorporate an after-tax analysis, into a real estate financial model, I'd recommend checking out my course, Commercial Real Estate Investing 101, and that's going to include a whole section on how to actually build out an after-tax analysis, including that interest expense 
and depreciation deduction. And as always, if you want access to all Break Into CRE courses on real estate financial modeling and deal analysis, all Break Into CRE models, and some additional one-on-one -on -one support, make sure to check out Break Into CRE Academy, and I'll link that in the description below. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video and want to see more content like this, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and share this with anyone else who might find this helpful. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.